I'm Micah Rothstein. I'm part of the glaucoma team, uh, along with Dr. Sheth, who was here earlier this morning. Um, and I am, um, well, I, I also want to thank Dr. Myers and Dr. Andrews and Ken for some great talks as well. Um, I am actually really excited to be announcing our next speaker. Um, I've just, I've personally known him for almost two years now, but he's one of these guys I feel like I've known him much longer, mostly probably because of the introduction from one of my long, my, almost my best friend uh, from, from training in Dallas, Dr. Neal. So I just feel like I've known him longer than that, but I've personally known him for two years. And I know he's very, he's very passionate. He's a great speaker about this topic. Um, you guys probably will not hear this anywhere else. It was pretty funny when, when he submitted his outline to COPE for approval. They didn't know what to do with it. They had never seen anything like this before. Um, there are probably a few talks about nutrition and AMD, but they didn't, they didn't really know what to do about it. So he uh, was very persuasive with uh, the folks that approved the credit. So um, big thanks to COPE for actually taking kind of a you know, a, a proactive stance on this and actually uh, allowing you guys to get the credit for this. Um, but it's good, uh, Dr. Kenobi is um, coming back to Colorado after uh, actually doing medical school and residency at, uh, well, what's now CU Health at the time was University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. So he's now back locally after uh, moving to Dallas. He was associate clinical professor at UT Southwestern since 2001. And since 2013, he's sort of made it his, maybe his life's work now. I mean, it's really, it's really his passion studying the nutritional effects of AMD. Um, it's kind of fitting that he's come back to Boulder, which is really sort of the, the epicenter of, well, it's one of the epicenters, I guess, of nutrition and, uh, um, you know, nutritional effects on disease. So he presented this theory uh, in, I think it was August, in the fall. Was it August at yes. uh, the Ancestral Health Symposium that was held in Boulder? So um, I found him to be, you know, a really passionate about his cause. And uh, well, without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy the next hour. This is Dr. Chris Obi Wan Kenobi. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you, my doctor. Today you're going to hear a revolutionary hypothesis for the cause of macular degeneration. This is a hypothesis that holds that macular degeneration is not only entirely preventable, but that it may be treatable and even possibly reversible in the earliest stages with diet, with an ancestral diet. So what I'm going to show you today is that macular degeneration was not so long ago a rare disorder. And today, as you know, it's an epidemic worldwide. And the only thing that's changed that could account for that is our diet. That's the only thing. So with that said, let me get started here. So I have a financial disclosure. I have no commercial or proprietary interest in any food, food companies, or products mentioned. I'm not a paid speaker. I do have a book on this subject, but I do not receive book royalties. So now this is almost a rhetorical question for us eye physicians here, but, but what is the lifetime risk of developing AMD in the United States or in the world today? And I'm just going to answer this right off the bat. It's nearly one in three and has been since 1992. So for those people 75 and older, right? You may not know, though, that globally, one of every 11 people over age 50 now has AMD. So this is a global problem. These people are centered primarily, though, in developed nations, all right? So, but what do you suppose the lifetime risk of developing AMD was in the year 1900? The answer is almost zero, one in many thousands. And I'm gonna show you this, and I think I can prove this to you. But how did we go from one in many thousands to nearly one in three in about 70 years because that's what happened. That's the question I want you to ask yourselves as we go through this today, okay? So by 1994, it was estimated that 15 million Americans had AMD. Uh, by 2020, it's estimated that 196 million people will be affected with AMD worldwide. 
The World Health Organization determined that in, uh, in 2002, more than two million people were blind worldwide. This is blind both eyes. So by now, I would estimate that's at least three million people. Think about that population. That's a good part of the state of Colorado, entirely blind, both eyes, from this disease. So here's the usual AMD progression, right? We go from normal to dry to wet. And then, of course, vision might go from like it is here on the left to that on the right. And the question is, is could that be due to diet and diet alone? And I will submit to you today that I believe that it is. And I'll show you why. So we're going to talk about ancestral diets versus westernized diets. So well, what is an ancestral diet? Well, it depends on who you ask. But my definition of an ancestral diet is any kind of diet that existed anywhere on the planet before 1880. And the reason I say that is because before 1880, we had no processed man-made foods with the exception of sugar. OK? So these, so the diet then, when you went to the grocery store, what you could come home with looked a lot like this. You could come home with meats, fowl, fish, eggs, fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, and seeds, and that's about it, right? And interestingly, those foods would have been grown the way they should have been grown. You know, cattle uh, uh, grazing on grass, chickens on pasture, pork on farms and ranches, right? Uh, fruits, vegetables, grains, all grown without pesticides and herbicides. This is an organic diet. Now, you can make that diet anything you want. You can make it Italian, Mediterranean, uh, something from Argentina, it doesn't matter, take your pick. But it starts with these kinds of foods. Now I'm going to show you that this is very different than the westernized diet, which as you know, looks a lot like this. Okay, but there's 600,000 food items available in the U.S. today. And so take your pick of what you want to put on this plate, but guess what? About 63 to 70% of what's on a westernized diet plate is made up of four nutrient deficient processed foods, three of which at least have some significant toxicities. Those four things, we're going to talk about these quite a bit. Refined added sugars, refined white flour, polyunsaturated vegetable oil, oils, and trans fats. So you take those four things, and that makes up about 63 to 70% of what you're looking at. And those things didn't exist before 1880, with the exception of sugar, in small quantities. This is a recipe for disaster, metabolic disaster. So now we've all seen some version of this statement for many decades, most of our careers, right? The etiology of AMD is unknown. We don't know what causes it. If we knew what caused it, we could prevent it, and we could at least prevent it, right? But we don't know the cause. This is the hypothesis that I proffered back in 2013. It goes like this. The displacing foods of modern commerce are the primary and proximate cause of AMD. And the corollary to this is that any type of ancestral diet will not only prevent AMD but may treat existing AMD. Now, back to the term displacing foods of modern commerce, just think of that right now as processed man-made foods. We'll come back to that. That's a really important issue. Okay, very briefly, I'm just going to spend a minute here to look at the histology of AMD. And you may not be able to see this all that well in the back, but I just want you to, uh, to notice that this is the healthy macula on the left, and we're moving to the very diseased macular degenerative uh, type macula on the right. And what we see is, is um, healthy photoreceptors, retinal pigment epithelium, Brooks membrane, and choriocapillaris. And as you move to the right, we see that you have photoreceptor loss, atrophy, atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, thickening and calcification of Brooks membrane, and choriocapillaris occlusion. Now, 
When the choriocapillaris occludes, basically that's sclerosis. That's like atherosclerosis. It's virtually the same thing on a micro scale. Brooks membrane thickens and calcifies very much like the intima layer of an artery. Lots of parallels here to cardiovascular disease. Ultimately, RPE cells undergo atrophy. They die. Each one of those RPE cells supports about 30 photoreceptors. Photoreceptors can't live without RPE. So when RPE cells die, photoreceptors die. Now, the RPE cells in the human are entirely non-regenerative. We only get one set. They never come back. You lose those, gone forever. Photoreceptors that are supported by those, gone forever. So keep in mind here, lots of parallels here with this vascular disease, thickening of Brooks membrane that behaves a lot like uh, vascular disease. Okay. So on to treatment. So just broadly, here's the basic treatment I think most of us would agree on. I'm not saying this is uh, all inclusive, but synthetic vitamins, the ARDS formula, dark leafy greens, we tell these people to exercise and not to smoke. Right now, I agree with all of this and a number of other things that we might put on this list probably, except I don't agree with the synthetic vitamins and I'm gonna show you why. So the first question, in my mind was, do synthetic vitamins prevent AMD? Well, we know there's, or you might know that there's evidence about this, but the answer is, in short, no, not in a single study. The Cochrane Collaboration looked at this in 2012. There have been four randomized controlled trials in this regard, 62,520 people, and what they found was this, people who took these supplements were not at decreased or increased risk of developing AMD. So these synthetic nutrients really had no benefit in terms of preventing disease, right? So the next question is, do synthetic vitamins prevent or slow progression of existing AMD? Well, we know we have some evidence here, right? Or we couldn't recommend them at all. But what I want you to know is that there's been 13 randomized controlled clinical trials looking at synthetic vitamins and the progression of AMD. Twelve of those trials found no benefit. One found a benefit. That's the ARIDS trial. Now, admittedly, the ARIDS trial was the biggest trial. It was, I think, 3,600 or so people. Lasted about six years, right? And let's look real quickly at, most of you probably know this, but just for review, one of four people had a benefit. Right? So three of four had none. 75% zero benefit. In ARIDS 2, we found out that adding lutein and zeaxanthin or omega 3s or both, again, provided no benefit. What you may not know is that Carl O's research, he and his colleagues in Tennessee looked at uh, the ARIDS formula and outcomes based on genetics. What they found was that 13% of those consuming ARIDS formula vitamins were substantially worse. Those that had high CFH and low ARMS2 genetic alleles, that group had a 135% had a, a progression of disease, meaning they had a more than doubling of their disease because they were on synthetic vitamins. So think about this. So you give these vitamins to your patients, one out of four benefits, but 13% could have a more than doubling of their progression of disease. Now, interestingly, insurance does not pay for this genetic mapping. So you're not gonna be able to test them and, and, and have insurance pay for it to determine these 13% that would, that would be potentially twice as bad off if you recommend the synthetic vitamins. But one out of four better, 13% worse, how much good are we doing? Now, I wanna mention a possible paradox here. So we expect that, or, or, I'm sorry, we know that the synthetic multivitamins and minerals don't prevent AMD in any trial. Yet we expect them to prevent progression of existing disease. If you put on your logician's hat, does that make sense? Now, I'm not saying it doesn't. I have my own thinking about this, and I'll, I'll come back to this, okay? So back to the, this is the hypothesis again that I proposed. The displacing foods of modern commerce are the primary and proximate cause 
of AMD. So where did I come up with this term, displacing foods of modern commerce? That comes from this man, Weston A. Price. For those of you who don't know him, Weston A. Price is the father of nutrition, in my opinion. Weston Price uh, was a scientist, a researcher, and a dentist who in the 1930s spent a decade traveling the world evaluating people on five continents, 14 nations, hundreds of tribes and villages, thousands upon thousands of people in attempt to determine first what it was about diets that kept people's teeth healthy. He was dental health was his primary interest. But his secondary interest was what it was about diets that kept people generally physically healthy and what resulted in physical degeneration and disease. And what Price found, no matter where he went on five continents, was first of all, people that looked like this on their native traditional diets. People in, that were brilliantly healthy, happy, disease-free, they had naturally straight, beautiful teeth, about 99% cavity-free, and these people enjoyed great immunity to degenerative diseases like arthritis, cancer, heart disease, and even immunity to infectious diseases like tuberculosis, as long as they continued their native traditional diets. But as soon as they began to consume what Price called the displacing foods of modern commerce, which he defined as white flour, sugar, canned, good, canned goods, sweets, confectionery, and vegetable oils, when they consumed these foods, the next thing that happened was dental decay, like these two ladies on the left. And then this was followed then later by loss of immunity to those degenerative diseases. Again, like arthritis, cancer, and infectious diseases. So then people began to develop those. Now, while we're here, all three of these ladies are Australian Aboriginals. The two on the left had been consuming our displacing foods of modern commerce. The young lady on the far right continued her native traditional Aboriginal diet. Now this is the scenario that played out in Price's research on five nations thousands and thousands of times again and again, exactly like this. These people were consuming so-called primitive diets. It's just their native traditional diet. There was dozens or hundreds of these diets, depending on how, how you want to classify them. First of all, macronutrient ratios made no difference. All this concern we have about high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat, high protein, all of that, none of that seemed to make any difference whatsoever in all of these diets that, that uh, Price found people to be living on and vibrantly healthy. What mattered was nutrient density, specifically micronutrient density. What I mean by that is vitamins and minerals. So all of these diets were of plant and animal origin and all contained sacred foods. Now the sacred foods were foods that were very rich in fat soluble vitamins. Those vitamins are hard to come by. They're not widely distributed in the food supply and they, but they came from animal products, uh, foods like organ meats, liver for example, fish eggs, even grass fed butter but these were foods that were rich in the fat soluble vitamins, primarily vitamins A, D, and K2. Those are critical. Now, Weston Price sampled these foods from these indigenous peoples all over the world and he sent them back, thousands and thousands of samples back to his labs in the United States and had them analyzed. And what he found was that these foods contained 10 times as many fat soluble vitamins, which was A, D, and K2, four times as many water-soluble vitamins, which was all the B-complex and C, and one and a half to 60 times more minerals than did the American diets of his day. That was the 1930s. Now, I assure you, we have a whole lot more processed food today than what they did in the 1930s. But, you know, what we've done is we've tried to replace all these naturally derived vitamins from real whole food with synthetic vitamins, pills, right? And we fortified our foods. We synthetically put vitamins and, and minerals into these foods where they didn't actually naturally belong because they'd been processed. 
So, but does that work? Well, the Cochrane Collaboration looked at this. 78 trials with a low risk of bias. They found a higher death rate from all causes for people consuming these synthetic vitamins, synthetic multivitamins, right? The relative risk, 1.04 fold. So in other words, these people are a little less healthy and they die a little sooner when they're consuming synthetic multivitamins. Now this is pretty interesting because you know the people taking, consuming multivitamins tend to be the ones that are more health conscious anyway. This would also include the ARIDS formula vitamins. It's just EC, beta carotene, zinc, and copper, right? So this is a multivitamin. It fits into this category. Now eventually, after Price's work, we have a whole boatload of research that has really strongly uh, correlated processed food consumption to what we now call, nutritionists call, diseases of Western civilization. Right? It's all these diseases, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, metabolic syndrome, osteoarthritis, Alzheimer's, obesity, autoimmune diseases, and plenty more. So it's just a partial list. But all of these diseases connected to processed food consumption. So I understood this about six years ago. And a couple of years later, I asked myself this when I really was digging deep. Could macular degeneration be another disease of Western civilization? Might it be a disease that just follows processed food consumption, like all the rest of these diseases? Well, let's try to find that out. So here's the risk factors for AMD as we know them. Aging and genetics, these are the big two, right? We all agree on that. But we also know that macular degeneration has been associated with heart disease, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, obesity, lack of exercise, smoking. Notice the conditions I'm listing are diseases of Western civilization, right? It's the same list. So what I'm saying to you is these diseases don't cause macular degeneration. They simply run with it because they're all caused by the same thing. That's my assertion. Now, but could macular degeneration just be a disease of aging or genetics? Could it be? Sure, it could be. If it was, if it is, then the prevalence should be the same today as it was 100 years ago. It should be the same in 1920 as in 1970, right? Unless you want to argue that our genetics changed, and I doubt anybody here wants to argue that. I mean, the, a hardcore evolutionist will argue that our DNA blueprint hasn't changed in 10,000 years. So, so the next questions then become, was AMD always so prevalent? In fact, when could ophthalmologists even see the macula? In 2013, I didn't know the answer to either of these, so I started a long investigation. Well, when could they see the macula? 1851, ophthalmologists could see the macula because of this man, Hermann von Helmholtz. So von Helmholtz was a German physician and physicist who at the age of 29 designed the ophthalmoscope. He published that design in 1851 so that people could manufacture it all around the world. And they did, and in fact, within a decade, the ophthalmoscope was in use around the world. In eight, uh, here's the original, his original ophthalmoscope. 1855 to 1870, ophthalmologists are producing atlases like this. Quite a number of atlases, in fact, lots of images, not a single image of macular degeneration, not one. In fact, 20, it would be 23 years after Helmholtz published the, 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 the uh, design of the ophthalmoscope before this man, Jonathan Hutchinson, London, England, would describe macular degeneration for the first time. He presented four cases that look consistent with AMD from his clinics. Another 11 years goes by, and this man, German ophthalmologist Otto Hobb, discussed macular degeneration in a lecture. He presented no cases. Another decade goes by. Now we're at 1895. Otto Hobb publishes a study. He's evaluated 50,000 ophthalmic patient medical records, 
and determined that macular degeneration was as rare as traumatic maculopathy and myopic maculopathy. How rare are those? I don't know about you guys, but in 24 years of practice, I saw a handful of those. I'd see that many AMD patients every day, right? So that's 1895. This is, you all know Fuchs. This is Ernst Fuchs textbook. This is my copy of his textbook from 1892. I got my hands on this thing. This is an 800 page textbook and it is brilliant. The descriptions would rival anything we have today in terms of clinic evaluation. This book has uh, 19, uh, 19 pages dedicated to a uh, chapter on retina, 21 pages on the chapter on diseases of the choroid. He dedicates two pages to the condition of retinitis pigmentosa, which we, you know affects one in 4,000 people. And in this all-encompassing textbook, 800 pages, he dedicates one sentence to the condition of macular degeneration. It reads like this. Finally, a disease of the macula is observed in old people, which usually affects both eyes about equally and is referable to senile changes. That was it. 1892. Julius Hirschberg, <clears throat> and you all know him, Hirschberg, published this book, The History of Ophthalmology, and the subtitle is The First and Second Half of the 19th Century, but this book goes all the way up through 1914. And this is a large book, and this is my copy of it, and it is 350 pages long, missing from this entire textbook, not a single mention of macular degeneration, not one. Now, in case you think that ophthalmologists weren't using their ophthalmoscopes, well, ophthalmologist Land Olton Snellen began collecting ophthalmoscopes in the 1860s or 70s. By, 19, by 1880, they had collected 86 models of ophthalmoscope. Um, electric bulbs were added to these in the 1880s. By, by uh, 1901, on the 50th anniversary, after Helmholtz's invention, uh, Landolt and Snellen had on display 140 models of ophthalmoscope in Atlantic City, New Jersey at an exhibition. By 1913, Landolt had collected 200 models of ophthalmoscope. Now, and in case you think that they're not, they weren't dilating and looking back inside the eye, well, in 1889, Fuchs textbook, the one I just showed you, extensively reviewed the use of midriatic dilating agents and uh, he reported that they used atropine, homatropine, hyocyamine, hyocene, gelsamine, and cocaine, all to dilate to complete exams. Their favorite at that time was a dilute homatropine because they said it lasted only about five hours maximum. Remember, that's from the 1880s. Okay, so if we jump ahead to 1920, there were 4.9 million Americans over the age of 65. If the prevalence of AMD in 1920 would have been the same as it was here in 1990, there should have been 1.1 million people in the U.S. with AMD, just in the U.S. Yet, there was no more than about 50 cases of AMD published in all of the world's literature at that point. 1927, this man, Sir Stuart Duke Elder, enters the picture. Now, you all know Duke Elder. He became the dominant force in ophthalmology for about the next 40 years. In 1927, he published this textbook. I know that's hard for you to see back there. It's, it, this is my copy. It's called Recent Advances in Ophthalmology, 1927. This is a 340-page textbook. Um, not a single word regarding macular degeneration. 1927. In fact, in the introduction of this book, quote, the two major diseases of ophthalmology, cataract and glaucoma, are purely physico-chemical problems, and he continues. Again, no mention of macular degeneration, not one. That's 1927. Now get this, 13 years later, in his next textbook of ophthalmology, 1940, he dedicates 13 pages to the condition of macular degeneration, 17 images, six of which are in full color, and he calls macular degeneration a common cause of failure in central vision in old people. So in the 1920s, he wasn't seeing AMD. He didn't even, I don't think he even knew about it. 
1930s, he was seeing it, and it was significant. I mean, the question's why? Framingham study, 1973-1975. Now, 8.8% of Americans over the age of 52 have AMD. 27.9% of those age 75 to 85. Now we have an epidemic, right? Millions of people affected now. A condition that wasn't worth mentioning in a comprehensive textbooks through the 1920s now is an epidemic. In 1996, Jennifer Evans and Richard Wormald in the United Kingdom published this study. So in the UK, the government has a blindness registry and with associated cause, so they could track the cause of blindness. So they looked at the cause of blindness going back as far as they could. 1933 to 1943, 6% of blindness due to AMD. You can see it bumped all the way up to 24% by 1970, 49% by 1990, it sits at 56% in 2014. So we went from 6% in the 1930s to 56% by 2014. The number was 54% in the United States in 2004. So it's, we're right on track with them. So Professor Emeritus Alan Bird of Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, probably the most published researcher of our times, wrote this in the Journal of Clinical Investigation in 2010. He wrote, quote, AMD is recognized as causing more than 50% of blind registration in Western society and is now designated as one of the major blinding diseases of the world. In contrast to the current high prevalence of AMD, in the 19th century, it was considered a rare disorder and described as chorioretinal disease in senile persons. He went on to say, there is evidence that the current increased prevalence of AMD cannot be fully explained by increased life expectancy. Furthermore, the disease is now recognized as a burden in societies in which it was considered rare 30 years ago. All right, he wrote this in 2010. The two societies he was talking about where it was rare 30 years ago, 1980, was Japan and India. And I'm going to show you Japan, and that's, that is exactly right. It was rare there in Japan and India in the 70s. So by all accounts, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, the prevalence of AMD is increasing and increasing drastically. Question is, why? What induced this? Well, you know what my answer is, right? Diet. So let's talk about the U.S. diet, because, and it'll apply to the world, as you'll see. Um, now, there's been four major processed foods, which we talked about briefly already, um, that have really changed the, the picture of the world's diet forever. The, three of those were introduced between 1880 and 1911. So let's talk about those three first. The first, white wheat flour, introduced in 1880. Why? Because up until 1880, all wheat was ground on stone mills. That gave you the whole grain. In 1880, we got roller mill technology. Roller mill technology can shear away the bran and the germ, giving this refined white flour. Well, the bran and the germ, removing that effectively removes B vitamins, E vitamins, fiber, minerals, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So now you have a nutrient deficient food where you didn't before. Today, wheat is 20% of the world's diet. In the U.S., 85.3% of that is refined white flour. Lauren Cordain's group showed this. So 85.3% of it is a nutrient deficient processed food, right? Second, vegetable oils, the PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. These were also introduced in 1880. So manufacturers then determined that they could take cotton seeds, which were a waste product, crush them, heat them, run them through a hydraulic press, and then subject them to this so-called batch refining. And in batch refining, which is a refinery type process, this mush goes in there and is treated to a, a petroleum-derived hexane solvent bath. Then they steam it, degum it, then chemically alkalinize it, bleach it, and deodorize it. Yes, all three chemically, 
And now we have something they say is healthy to eat, right? You know what this is? A vegetable oil refinery. I mean, these massive refineries, I used to think these were just petro for petroleum. This is a vegetable oil refinery, refinery. Well, you know why they're so huge is because 24% of the U.S. calories, and a, and, that, and a lot of the world is tracking the same, are getting, the, uh, that's where your food's coming from, 24% of it, coming out of these. Do you think your food ought to be coming out of these? I mean, I don't, but, and this is why grocery aisles look like this. I mean, there's usually an entire section dedicated to these vegetable oils, which didn't exist before 1880. Now, these are extraordinarily oxidized products. They're, all of that heat and chemical treatment oxidizes these products severely. They're oxidized by the time they're poured into the bottle. Then you take them home, you cook with them, or your restaurant or your fast food place cooks with them. They oxidize further, and then you metabolize them, they oxidize again. This could be an entire lecture, and I'd love to do that. This is a huge topic, but these are incredibly dangerous and play a huge role in vascular disease. Um, I think these are the single most dangerous thing in our food supply, again, because a toxin's all about the dose, and we're getting 24% of our calories this way. Now take a look, this is from our own research. This is vegetable oil consumption over time, going back to, you know, we really only began to consume these probably in 1880, but you can see we consumed about two grams a day down here from 1880 to about 1909, and then this consumption really took off with the, with the use of the expeller press, which really, uh, which really in, hastened production. Uh, and, and so by um, 2012, we're at 80 grams of vegetable oil per person per day. All right, now, in the year 1900, 99% of our added fats came from animal fat, lard, butter, and beef tallow. That's the only thing you could cook with, pretty much. 99% of it. Go up here to 2005, right up about here somewhere, 86% of our added fats came from vegetable oils. It's almost a complete role reversal. Now keep in mind, in 1900 we didn't have any AMD. We also didn't have heart disease. Both were incredibly rare and I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that about heart disease as well just very briefly. Okay. So our third, nutrient deficient processed, in this case, entirely man-made concocted food, trans fats, introduced by Procter & Gamble in 1911 with this Crisco. So we've consumed billions, I think it's trillions of pounds of this stuff since 1911. Um, and I'm not going to go into this, but these are very, very dangerous. Uh, the US FDA removed trans, uh, man-made trans fats. These are partially hydrogenated and hydrogenated vegetable oils uh, were, were removed from grass status, generally regarded as safe status. On June 16, 2015, they allowed manufacturers three years to get these out of our food supply. But guess what? In 2018, these won't be leaving our food supply because vegetable oils, the polyunsaturates, contain up to 4.6% trans fats, 1.1% on average. So if you're getting 80 grams of vegetable oils a day, you're getting some hefty doses of trans fats, whether you want to or not. The only way to get rid of these is to remove vegetable oils as well, and I don't see that happening. Now, while we're here, AMD versus vegetable oils and trans fats, there's been 10 studies correlating increased risk of AMD development or progression to increasing vegetable oil or trans fat consumption. Ten studies have made this link. Okay, our fourth nutrient deficient processed food, sugar. Now sugar's been around for centuries, but in much increasing doses. So in 1822, we consumed six pounds of sugar per person per year in the United States. By 1999, that was 108 pounds per person per year. A 17-fold increase in our sugar consumption in that time period. So put the four of those foods together, the ones we just reviewed, and you've got the yellow slice of our pie here, 
of our edible pie, processed foods, added vegetable oils, trans fats, sugars, and refined grains. 63% of the American diet in 2009. Let me remind you, none of these foods existed before 1880. Look, only 12% is going to plant foods, 25% to animal foods. This is the most important slide here because this is the recipe for metabolic disaster. Heart disease, cancer, metabolic syndrome, obesity, all of that, and I will submit to you AMD. This is the recipe. Okay, so now we're going to see that AMD follows processed foods worldwide. Now, we used in our own research proxy markers for processed foods. Sugar was first. Sugar among nutritionists is a well-known proxy marker of processed food. Why? Because it's in 74% of the 600,000 food items available in the U.S., and it's 21% of our caloric consumption. Great processed food marker. Vegetable oils, again, 24% of our food supply. We don't have numbers exactly, but we know it's in thousands and thousands of processed food, so it's also an excellent uh, processed food marker. So we believe that these two food items will track around 90% of processed foods. Keep that in mind. So now we're gonna see what happens when we track these. So this is the United States um, AMD versus sugar and vegetable oils. So we see sugar in the uh, blue here and uh, vegetable oils down here in black um, split out in the red as harmful vegetable oils. These are the polyunsaturates, okay? You can see that we consume almost exclusively polyunsaturated uh, fats in the US, not saturated fats. And then AMD in the green bars here. Now, um, you can see that we were tracking sugar from the 1840s but, and, and, sugar, uh, and uh, vegetable oils since about 1900 here. But what I want to point out here is, is that here is when we didn't have any AMD, way back here in 1900, right? By 1930s, in here somewhere, we had some AMD, just like the UK. By the 1960s or 70s, somewhere here, we're at epidemic proportions. Now the point of this is that if you look at all 25 nations that we've, that we've evaluated, what we see is that you have, to, you have to consume these foods for about usually about 30 to 50 years before you end up with epidemic proportions of AMD. Okay, so next we're gonna look at Japan. So Japan is the quintessential nation to illustrate this whole point because we see that AMD occurs right in a lot of our, our own lifetimes, uh, a, a huge AMD increase in prevalence. So first, let's look at their food. Harmful vegetable oils, the polyunsaturates, 10 grams a day in 1961, rising fourfold to about 40 grams a day by the early 2000s. Sugar consumption, 50 grams a day back in 1961, bouncing up to about 80, 90 some grams a day for the last four or five decades. Now look at AMD. 0.2% prevalence from 1974 to 1979, rising up to 11.4% prevalence by 2007. A 57-fold increase in the prevalence of AMD in 30 years. 57-fold. Now, how can we explain that with aging or genetics? We can't. Okay, Nigeria is the next one we'll look at. In Africa, of course, and this, is near, this should be nearly, if not 100% African population. You can see their sugar consumption is really low. Vegetable oil consumption, extremely low, the harmful vegetable oils, all right? And now their AMD prevalence, very low, 3.2% in 2004. That's this first green bar, all right? So that pales in comparison to our 22.8%, right? Well, it should because they're consuming really low amounts of sugar and vegetable oils. Um, but this 3.2%, this gets more interesting. That was in Onitsha, Nigeria. That's a metropolitan population of 1.1 million people. You know what they have access to there? Grocery stores. That's where they're getting the processed food. 
Okay, now look at this little tiny blip over here in 2007. That's a 0.1% prevalence of AMD. This was in southwestern rural Nigeria. You know what these people don't have access to? Grocery stores, right. They're eating a native traditional diet. They can't get to the processed food. So keep this in mind, this 0.1% prevalence of AMD in these people of southwestern rural Nigeria who are Africans, because this gets really interesting. Here's the next one, Barbados. Barbados down in the Caribbean is a 97% African population. They came from West Africa, all right, that's their heritage. And I want to just tell you right off the bat, Barbados has been known for uh, five decades to be a processed food mecca. It's so much like Greenland and Iceland, they're importing all their food. They don't, they don't make anything local, they don't hardly eat anything from local. And you can tell by looking at this, look at their sugar consumption, 140, 180 grams a day, massive. More than four times the World Health Organization's recommendations. Their vegetable oils, climbing since the late 70s to 80s, 20 some grams a day in here. Um, now, and what I want to tell you is, is that in all the literature, Barbados has a, quote, world profile of metabolic disease, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obesity, all that. Of course they would. That's what happens when people eat like this. Now, finally, look at their macular degeneration, 24.3%. 243 times greater than the Africans of southwestern rural Nigeria who can't get processed food. Again, how could we explain this with aging or genetics? Next nation to look at, Solomon Islands. Look at their sugar consumption, very low, 20-ish grams a day since, the 19, since 1961. Harmful vegetable oils, zero since 1961. Look at their macular degeneration, 0.2% prevalence is what this is. This is a population of 630,000 people, Solomon Islands. They have three ophthalmologists for that entire population. Each ophthalmologist, reviewing their records, determined they'd seen about one AMD patient every two months over the last 10 years. Look what they don't have sugar and vegetable oils. So we have in the US at least 74 fold more AMD than they do. But you saw the difference in our food consumption. They can't get processed foods down there because the companies don't want to, they don't want to ship it down there. These people are too poor to even buy it. They live off the land, basically. Very similar here in Kiribati. So Kiribati is an island nation located um, 1,250 miles directly south of, of Hawaii. It's 113,000 population. Um, very, very poor. They don't get hardly any processed food. They eat mostly fish and root vegetables, and, but they get a lot of sugar. Look at their sugar. It's bouncing around from 60 up to um, even up to 120 grams a day. But look at their vegetable oils. The harmful, none. 2015, their AMD prevalence about 0.2%. Now, this population of 113,000 people has one eye care provider, Dr. Rabib Takirawai, ophthalmologist, for the whole island. In 2015, he saw two patients with macular degeneration for the year. But look what they don't have, vegetable oils and they really don't have much processed food at all, except for their sugar. Now, very briefly, I want to look at uh, one study on AMD prevalence in uh, the little town of Salandra, Italy. This is, Salandra is a little town located in the southern part of Italy in what's called the Basilicata region. Um, this, this is a picture of, the, of this, um, this little town. It's, it's located at the, at the at the top of a hill, the end of a road, um, surrounded by farming community, 3,363 people when this study was done in 1989. And these researchers set out to, quote, test the hypothesis 
that an environmental factor scarce in such a remote community but ubiquitous in modern industrial societies might modify the risk of, of developing age-related maculopathy. This was one of the only studies done of, of AMD prevalence that really carefully analyzed diet. I mean, carefully analyzed the whole diet. Most other prevalence studies, as you know, they look at race, age, genetic risk factors, geographic locale, but not diet. Okay, so in Salandra, they had 360, 366 subjects, 60 to 89 years of age, 87% were born and raised in Salandra. Both parents of 77% of them also born and raised in Salandra. So there's almost no immigration or immigration from this little town. So it's a really great site to study AMD prevalence. So here's what they found. Researchers reported overall AMD prevalence as 1.1%. That it turned out to be two patients with discoid scars, uh, discoform scars, and two patients with geographic atrophy. Now, there were also two patients with soft drusen. So if you add these into the mix, which I did because this would make the study most consistent with the Wisconsin age-related maculopathy grading system, which we use here in the U.S., and that would bump up the overall AMD prevalence to 1.7%. Now this pales in comparison to the typical, say, 14 to 20 plus percent that you would find in most developed nations like the U.S., the U.K., and even Italy, right? Very low prevalence of AMD at 1.7%. So let's see what they're eating. This is what the researchers said, quote, participants tended to use local food, resorting only occasionally to industrial shelf available products. Most stated that bottled olive oil, daily, uh, I'm sorry, dairy products, meat, and vegetables were from their own resource or from local small farmers. The food consumed is produced and prepared locally and most is eaten fresh. Now, 99% never consumed bottled olive oil. Did they eat olive oil? You bet. They made their own. 85% never consumed packaged cheese. Again, they made their own. 74% never consumed cakes. 75% never consumed sausages. 89% never consumed frozen meat. They butchered according to need. They ate soon after they butchered their, the animals. 95% uh, never consumed frozen vegetables and 99% never consumed pre-cooked pre packaged food. No TV dinners for these people. Here's the conclusions that I drew from this. These people are consuming a native traditional diet. I mean, this is like our diet was in the 19th century. Processed man-made foods are rare. Polyunsaturated vegetable oil, sugar, refined white flour, and trans fats, all exceedingly rare. The result, AMD is bordering on rare. Okay, now I want to raise an issue here. Ancestral diets contain animal fat. Lots of it, potentially. Saturated fats, right? Is this a problem? I mean, some of you might still be concerned about saturated fats. I don't know. Let's just, I want to go over through this real, real quickly. Here's some populations with high saturated fatty acid consumption and no heart disease. In Africa, the Maasai, the Rendile, the Samburo, and Fulani tribes all consume, they, these are pastoralists. They, they eat almost exclusively the meat, milk, and blood of the cattle they herd. 66% of their calories coming from animal fat. About half of that is saturated. So about 30% of their diet is saturated. Yet none of these societies have any heart disease. In fact, these people are brilliantly healthy as long as they stick with their native traditional diet, just like the people that Weston A. Price found. As long as they stick with that diet, they're good. The Inuit and Eskimos, traditionally very high animal fat diets, they consumed everything with seal oil, which is the equivalent of our pork lard. Um, lots of moose and caribou, and they liked the fatted animals. Again, no heart disease. The inhabitants of Tokelau in the South Pacific, these people consume 54 to 62 percent of their calories from coconut oil. Now, coconut oil, I think, is a ballpark 93% saturated fat. So they're getting about 40 to 50% of their calories from saturated fat. More saturated fat than anybody else on the planet. And yet, 
The inhabitants of Tokelau are brilliantly healthy and heart disease is an extraordinary rarity. In case that's not convincing enough, well, the Cochrane Collaboration in 2010 looked at all the studies on saturated fat and heart disease, and they came up with this conclusion, quote, these meta-analyses suggest no overall effect of saturated fatty acid consumption on coronary heart disease events. Now, there was another meta-analysis done that year, same reason, exact same outcome. Now, finally, we ran, this is from our own research, we looked at saturated fat and vegetable oils versus heart disease from 1900 forward. So here's heart disease in red. Here's saturated fat in the purple. And here's vegetable oil consumption. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see any correlation between saturated fat and heart disease. But look at the correlation between vegetable oils and heart disease. Now, correlation is not causation. I'm very clear on that. But when diseases take 30, 40, and 50 years to occur, that, that's the incubation period for heart disease and for certain cancers and for macular degeneration, right? You're not going to have a double-blind, randomized, controlled clinical trial that's going to last 40 years. The longest controlled clinical trial that was double-blind and randomized that I know of was the LA Veterans uh, uh, Heart Disease Trial. Eight years. That's the longest one on record. So how do you evaluate this? Correlations, you have to really look at the world's laboratory. That's what Weston A. Price did. Okay, folks, I'm going to wrap up. So AMD was a medical rarity from 1851 to 1930. I don't believe there's any question about that. By 1970s, it was epidemic in the U.S. and the U.K. and other nations following suit as they all westernized their diets. Today, over 190 million people with AMD. What changed? What changed is the displacing foods of modern commerce. Now, we have evidence for proximate cause because if you look at our data in 25 nations, I've just given you a thumbnail sketch, but if you look at 25 nations, the, the processed foods always come first, then macular degeneration. It's never the other way around. The temporal relationship, again, about 30 to 50 years of consumption. There's a dose-response relationship. You've seen it. The example, the perfect example was the, uh, the, the Africans of southwestern rural Nigeria with a prevalence of AMD of 0.1% where they can't get processed foods versus the Africans of Barbados at 24.3% where processed foods are the norm, right? If you look at all of our data, I think the relationship is nearly a mathematical certainty. Now, I want to specifically point out the PUFA vegetable oils because I believe these are the greatest contributor to AMD. I think these are biological poisons, and they're also carrying trans fats. I believe they're the single greatest contributor to irreversible blindness, period. But not to lose the big picture, it's that the displacing foods of modern commerce are what lead to AMD. So I ask you, if you believe this hypothesis might have validity, to do your own investigation. Start learning more about this and consider this hypothesis. 196 million people are losing vision today and another 90 million expected to in the next in the next 23 years, by 2040. I believe it's all preventable. I want to thank you for your attention. It's been an honor and a pleasure. <laughs>